Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the GCFM Award Annual Program Speakers Bureau. My name is Marjorie Deanhart, and I'm the president of the Garden Club Federation of Massachusetts. Every year, we offer an opportunity for our members to see snippets of a presentation from speakers who are willing to present to our garden clubs across the state. In today's presentation, they will be able to demonstrate a two minute clip of their presentation while telling us who they are and what other programs they may also offer. We hope you will enjoy this webinar. And of course, we, also have, we will also have the names of the presenters and their contact information available on our website. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. It's, good morning, it's really a pleasure to be here today to tell you about the programs that we offer. I'm Joan Butler, my friend Yana Milbacher and I are avid gardeners, plant collectors, garden designers, and writers. We've presented programs at flower shows, botanic gardens, horticultural societies, and many, many garden clubs in the Northeast and beyond. Our programs are richly illustrated PowerPoint presentations that feature our love of horticulture, design, and garden travel, and photography. Handouts are provided for each topic, and our programs can be presented virtually or in person. And let me give you a rundown on what we offer. Um, we have programs about native plants. This program features native shrubs and trees that add health to our environment, and beauty and interest to our gardens and public spaces. In birdscaping, you'll learn about the benefits and joys of creating garden habitats for birds that include native plants that are vital for food and nesting sites. And this program explores the beauty and unique adaptations of our early blooming native woodlanders, special focus on those that are easily adapting to the home garden. And we have programs about gardening in each season, Spring is the season that we all wait for. Discover the many lovely perennials and bulbs that add colorful flowers and interesting foliage to the early garden. And summer. Learn about design strategies and perennials that will make your garden pop. And in fallscaping, um, you'll learn about plants and design techniques that will help you create a vibrant fall garden. Uh, the garden can be magical even in winter, Learn how to extend your be the beauty of your garden into this often forgotten season. And we have programs about spe specific garden types and gardening passions. Create your own shady retreats using techniques that will light up shady corners with plants that thrive in low light conditions. Also use art objects, seeding, and water features. Beautiful containers can, can really enhance your garden space. Jazzy containers are the jewelry of the garden, elevating it from good to great. And some of us have um, passions that need a little extra help to have them fit into the garden. Design a beautiful garden based on color, texture, and placement of incredible hosta and companion plants. And the basics. Learn about the different prop propagation techniques, including growing from seed, cuttings, and division. And this is a combination PowerPoint lecture and demonstration. My friend Yana has written four books on garden tourism and her presentations offer armchair tours of the best public gardens, arboretums, historic mansion gardens and nurseries in the Northeast and beyond. With her programs, you can travel near with programs that focus on the Northeast, including one about the best specialty nurseries. And you can travel far. Um, to Hudson River Valley, Florida, and Charleston. And the fourth one is historic mansions decorated for the holidays. And you can travel even farther. Head across the pond for four virtual tours of historic gardens in Scotland, Cornwall, Ireland, and Wales. Please visit our website and learn more about our programs and learn more about us, um, enchantedgardensdesign.com. Thank you very much and happy gardening. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm Deborah Chad, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my work. Naturalistic gardening is hot, and I offer three programs on the subject. Each presentation stands alone, but together they form a basic course on how to make a garden naturalistic. What works? 
what doesn't, and why. New Perennials, A Love Story is a personal introduction to the design principles behind gardens like New York's Highline. It begins with the strange but true tale of my gardening conversion and the five year transformation of my garden from this to this. I share the most important things I've learned, including structure's role in naturalistic balance, the balance between coherence and contrast seen in meadows. I show how relationships between the shapes and colors of neighboring plants affect that balance and contribute to a naturalistic look and feel. The practical do's and don'ts I offer will help you solve your own garden dilemmas. In Not Your Mother's Garden, I take you on a photo tour of my own highly unusual new perennial garden. And I explain how it differs from the traditional uh, gardens that you're used to seeing. Many of the plants are unfamiliar, even to experienced and knowledgeable gardeners. And they're combined according to certain rules that most people find eye-opening. These plants were all introduced during the new perennial movement, which inspired what we now think of as naturalistic planting. And they exhibit the qualities required for naturalistic effects. So what's new about these plants and what can they do for you? Walk through my garden with me to find out. In Reimagined Gardens, I present makeovers from my design archive. Each talk is a how-to step-by-step discussion of my design process. Help, there are monsters in my bed. The first lecture examines the makeover of a tiny garden in Wabin, Massachusetts. After outlining the principles behind naturalistic planting design, I analyze the monster makeover in detail. For example, how and why did I choose these particular plants for these particular spots? And how did I ensure a long season of interest? The small scale of this planting makes it relevant to most residential gardens. The design concepts and strategies work regardless of scale or horticultural zone. And the steps can be followed by any home gardener. Reimagine Gardens offers you a takeaway you just can't get anywhere else, a reliable method for reimagining your own. And I'll add that for medical reasons, all of my presentations are virtual. Thank you. Laura. Thank you, Deborah Chudden. Next up will be Angelina Shoot. Actually, it's Angelina and Mike Shoot. Yeah, you forgot me. <laughs> okay, Mike and Angelina Shoot. Thank you. If I could get it, right. how do you get rid of this thing? Okay. Under me. Right. Well, we're just going to go here because I can't. Uh, Go up to your first slide. All right. Okay, I'm Mike and this is Angelina. We are co-owners of Rose Solutions, a landscape consulting company that specializes in rose horticulture. We do lectures, lots and lots of lectures. We also do workshops and seminars. Those are longer programs where we do a deep dive in some aspect of rose horticulture. We will come in person, which we prefer, or we'll come virtually via Zoom. Uh, and that's been good for January and February meetings everywhere. We've also written two books, Roses for New England, A Guide to Sustainable Rose Gardening, and Rose Gardening Season by Season, which is a journal. We publish the Northeast Rose Gardener. It's a quarterly e-newsletter, and it's offered absolutely free for anyone who wants to sign up. Okay, we have 10 programs. We could spend all morning talking about them, but we only have a few minutes. Our most popular program is this one right here because it appeals to every gardener who wants to grow roses, which is all of us. It explains everything you need to know in six easy to follow steps that takes the mystery out of rose gardening. 
We include plenty of tips and personal anecdotes and are more than 25 years of rose gardening experience. And this demonstrates how easy it is to grow great roses in your backyard. Another popular program is Roses for New England, and this is based on our book. This addresses the challenges of rose gardening. Uh, uh, <laughs> excuse me. And we discuss the six basic steps as well as the best way to plant, prune, and when to protect your roses. We also include new rose varieties that will perform well in New England. This is a really special program and I'll tell you why. It covers the history of English roses as well as the unique David Austin breeding program. And it's actually a collaboration between David Austin roses and us and includes old favorites as well as new introductions plus a list of varieties that are known to grow well right here in New England. In 2019, Angelina and I visited David Austin Roses in the UK, and we spent an entire day there, and we got a personal tour around the place, and we went to behind the scenes stuff, and we're gonna bring a lot of that into our, uh, into our program, and shows you how a big time rose nursery actually works. Okay, selecting sustainable roses, is a program that features modern, recently introduced variety as well as old favorites. They're disease resistant, winter hardy, easy to grow, and they bloom all season. It delves into the core of sustainability, explains the different grades of roses, the different types of roses, their growth habits, and how to select the best roses for your garden. And we have a couple of travel programs. This is the, uh, one of them. It's a virtual garden tour. And we take you to five gardens. We'll take you to the gardens at David Austin Roses in England. Then we go on to gardens in Rome, Florence, and a spectacular garden right outside of Paris. We end the tour in Canada at the La Roseray in the Montreal Botanical Garden, which is a beautiful garden with 10,000 roses. And it's also within driving distance of New England. So that's us. We could we could continue on and on, but we don't need to. We've made our point. You can get descriptions of all our programs on our website, www.rosesolutions.net. And um, we can leave it at that. However, one thing we do like to mention is if you need a speaker at the last minute, contact us. Maybe we can help. We're done. Over. Fini. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a cute ending. I appreciate it. Okay. Am I there? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Isla Cox. I am a plant lover, student of garden and plant history. And I have two programs that I offer, the history of the tulip and the chrysanthemum's journey. They are both in person and virtual. Both of them are inspired by a plant's involvement with the cultures that they find themselves in and that they're brought to. In the tulip, I like to start with a plant and what the plant is all about. We start in the Himalayas, talk about the bulb, Take, it, take us through ancient Persia, which is really our first record of its encounter with culture, travel with the Turks, end up trying to invade Vienna, when we in fact get the tulip into Western Europe. Now we all think that the tulip comes from Holland, but fortunately we're learning slowly that it doesn't. We spend some time with a hot, moment in the 17th century when we have tulip mania. We look at the Dutch commercial prominence, the development of discretionary money, how it intersects with the tulip. We look at the tulip mania. I have a few minutes when we, we also talk about growing bulbs commercially in the 21st century. The second is the chrysanthemum's journey, a little bit more complex. We talk about the type of plant that it is and how competitive it can be in the world because of the way it's 
anatomically put together with about a thousand different ovaries to produce seed. How it started gives us a chance to go back biologically about a quarter of a million years and see how the, the gene pool for the chromosome, for, I'm sorry, the gene pool for the chrysanthemum actually floats on the continental, in the continental drift and ends up in Eurasia. It has third cousins all over the world. Target flowered plants in South America, like the sunflower, the gerber in Australia, the zinnia in Central America, and ours in North America, who tend to grow on clusters on stems like our goldenrod and asters. We take a deep dive into China and the 3,500 years that it has been food and medicine, beverage and pesticides, a garden plant and a cultural icon, and how they take it to Japan where it's taken, takes Japan by storm. Chinese teach the Japanese practices of hybridizing, pruning, soil building, grafting, and the Japanese absolutely thrive on it, making the chrysanthemum a cultural icon around which they build every year annually for the last 1500 years, autumn festivals. The imperial family adopts it as its crest, still used today after a thousand years. And we see the Japanese craft aesthetic with the chrysanthemum involved in textiles and ceramics, art forms of all kinds like wood blocking. And this gives us a chance too, to look at European exploration, to find plants and bring them back to Western Europe, getting to the Orient in about the 16th century. How we bring live plants home and how long it took to find a way to do that. And then we look at North America and what the what the chrysanthemum was to us when it first arrived, and then of course, what it has become. I invite you to see my webpage. I'm sorry, see my ad on the Garden Club webpage. Contact me with the information that's there. I'd love to talk to you representing to your Garden Club. Thank you. Thank you, Isla, well done. Christy Dustman. You're next. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I see you. You want to share your screen, please? Yes, please. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Christy Dustman. I, I am a landscape designer, and I've had a business uh, for 25 years. So I didn't prepare... Uh, something with photos, but I thought that I would just show you what I was going to talk about today while I'm talking about it. So um, I was raised by crazy garden people and uh, inadvertently I, I went back to school and uh, started my own design installation and maintenance company. And one of the things I really love doing is teaching. And so I've taught quite a bit for the Garden Federation, garden clubs, uh, the Boston Flower Show, and on the national stage. Uh, I've won a design awards, and my own garden has been showcased on national tours, including the Garden Conservancy Tour, as well as it was featured in Fine Gardening Magazine in 2021. So when I speak, um, I really try to make information accessible, visually impactful, practical, and memorable. So rather than showing a lot of pretty photos, I use photos to illustrate my thought process behind what I do and why I do it. Um, and when I'm speaking, somehow I, I, I become very funny. So I'm very funny and often irreverent uh, as I'm talking about things. Um, so I try to really give an experiential and engaging lecture rather than something that you would see just in a book. And I do receive very favorable reviews. So um, I love plants. I'm a total plant nut. Uh, 
I love satisfying design and I have spent a lot of time trying to define how do you achieve that feeling of, ah, this is just right in the garden. So some of my um, talks speak to that. So as a designer and plant collector, my hands are in the dirt and I'm speaking from experience and seeing thousands of gardens, including quite a bit uh, abroad. I've gone to many countries where I, I use those photos in my lectures. Uh, so it's not just from a book. So speaking topics uh, related to landscape design. So how does a landscape designer think? You know, I think a lot of us just assume that this magical, perfect design like just comes to you or comes to me like out of nowhere. And in fact, there's there's quite a bit of um, process and considerations to get to a satisfying design. So how does a landscape designer think? Um, I talk a lot about balance in the landscape. So there's three different kinds, symmetry, asymmetry, and radial balance. So that's an interesting lecture. And I, as a landscape designer, um, you might think that the first thing I think about is plants, but actually the first thing that I think about is what are the outdoor problems that landscaping can solve? So as you might imagine recently, uh, water in the, in the house, in the basement, outside it has been a really uh, big issue. So anyway, so I talk about some of what I would call the unsexy aspects of garden planning um, that I believe must be successful for the garden to be successful. I also talk about objects in the garden. Um, I talk about planting design. So again, I think People think that like somehow we're born with this magical understanding of how to put plants together. Um, so that's something that I try to demystify. A special love of mine is conifers. So I am the uh, vice president of the American Conifer Society in the Northeast region. So um, I have several lectures about conifers. And when I say conifer, I mean something very different than the big, huge, enormous blob of a you that you might think of in front of someone's house. So that's a pretty interesting lecture. I do uh, talk about them as living sculptures because I think they have a very sculptural uh, essence. I'm very interested in Japanese gardens. So I have a lecture about um, kind of what are the design components, design strategies that are found in Japanese gardens and how we might be able to translate them in our own gardens. Um, a fair number of garden clubs after I've spoken, uh, ask if they can come and tour my own personal garden uh, to see design things. And I have a, a large collection of conifers and just, sculptures in the garden. So that is, is something that I love doing. I love having people come see the garden and hopefully leave with uh, the, with the, with the uh, permission to do something out of the norm. That really is my, my thing. In terms of hands-on uh, workshops, this is a very interesting workshop, this experiential hands-on workshop. Basically what I do is I have people in the garden club bring in all kinds of small objects. And through, through an exercise that we do, you start to realize that plants in fact are objects in the garden and it matters what their shape and size and relationship is. Um, it's a really interesting uh, way of, of changing how you think about plants. I love doing hands-on demonstrations of pruning and I've done them both outside with real plants outside. And I've actually done them inside where we bring in some different uh, pieces of different kinds of plants. So I talk about the, the proper tools. It's, I consider myself a master pruner. And then I, I do teach multi-session classes on either landscape design or planting design. 
So I have done that before for um, a couple garden clubs that have wanted a longer, basically a, a, a class um, on one of these two topics to be able to work on um, either landscape design or planting design for their own home. So um, that that is is basically me, and uh, I love I love teaching and I love sharing my enthusiasm uh, and irreverence about uh, plants and the outdoor world. So that's it. Thank you, Christy. Next up is Diane. Edgecombe. Diane, are you ready? Um, hold on, I'm just moving an item on my screen. Yes, okay, I am ready to go. Welcome. Hello everyone, I'm Diane Edgecombe and I have something different. These are performances. And these are performances that are brought to garden clubs, although I have many that I do out in the landscape, out in the world. I've performed at Tower Hills Botanic Garden, the Arnold Arboretum. As you can see here on your screen, I'm at Copley Square telling the story of the cherry tree. And I work oftentimes with a harper, my harpist, Margot Chamberlain. So I am a storyteller. I am a singer. I'm a performer and I love telling the stories about nature. So these are the very old folk tales that were told for a long time. And I come to the garden clubs with storytelling and heart performances. A lot of times people like to invite the community in for these shows. So it will be, sometimes they'll collaborate with a library and do it together. But it's a great way for people to get to know about your garden club. It's also been brought to uh, presidential teas, those kinds of things, but they're entertaining, evocative, and I've been told that the performance is also very relaxing. <laughs> um, so that's good. And people can sit back and enjoy and hear these old folk tales. And as I often say, after you hear a folk tale about a flower and then you're working in the garden, the the story about this flower, this plant, surrounds it like it's a new perfume. And it's like a meditation. So um, I've been on NPR. I perform at theaters. And I'll show you a little bit of video uh, once I talk to you about the different performances that I have uh, at the very end. So I have fantastical folk tales of flowers. And this is available year round, but also very popular in the wintertime. And that's done with uh, storytelling, song, and Celtic harp. And I also have fantastical folk tales of trees. And you can see on the, uh, the screen, there's Wellfleet Gardeners uh, talking about uh, the response to the presentation and Pumperog Woods, um, where people were using this as an event to get the community in. You brought my garden alive to me <laughs> in the most unusual and delightful way. I will never see a rose in the same way again. <laughs> so that's a beautiful thing. Fantastical Folk Tales of Trees, which is um, uh, stories and legends about trees, Kansakura, the cherry tree, dancing spirit of the birch from Czechoslovakia. And again, there's songs along with this. In December, the winter solstice in story and song, which has been at the Lincoln Garden Club, as well as many others. And uh, they said your holiday program received rave reviews from our members, which is good. And um, that's very surprising to people to find out why people kiss under the mistletoe and hear the legend behind it. And the story of uh, Helleborus Niger, the Christmas rose, that's also told in I Come With Musicians. Um, my newest one is channeling Rachel Carson. And this is... Um, it's a storytelling, uh, just a solo storytelling, but also it's a workshop for garden club members that I lead. And I'm very familiar with this to co cultivate our own stories. So I'm just going to um, play just a teeny bit of this right here. I've been a wandering um, all this and you don't have to have slides, but if you had a slide uh, possibility, you can be accompanied. And so it's again, storytelling and music. Of May. And the hedges and fields are clothed. So this is all on my website. As the These performance leaves. descriptions, I'll also have the an add up that has the URL. And you can see some of the different stories. Will you please open 
you know, uh, are on this video right there, including acting out bees. So I think I'm at the end of my time. Um, landed right on King Solomon's nose and stung him right on the nose. Him on the nose, not good. Okay. Um, Thank you, everyone. Again, I'm Diane Edgecombe. Um, I have performances for garden clubs that are related to nature and can be done at any time of the year. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Diane, sorry. Um, next up is Erica Rumbley. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for hosting. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, my name is Rachel Lewis. I'm here from the New Garden Society. Uh, I'm an educator and the operations and development manager. I'm here to talk about prison gardens uh, and encourage those of you looking for speakers for your garden club series to consider bringing a speaker to address prison gardens um, into your community. Uh, so I've been with the New Garden Society for about two years. Uh, I grew up in green spaces. This time of year, I always flash back to um, my first memory of encountering skunk cabbage, which is, of course, uh, a really early spring plant. Uh, looks very alluring, and once you interact with it, that smell is hard to forget. Uh, and a lot of my life has been paced out this way, thinking about changes uh, to the world around me, changes to how I can be nourished or not by the plants that are growing in different seasons. And I really value um, the way that uh, my garden has affected my, my concept of time in my life, whether that be slowing down or speeding up. Uh, I bring that up because I want us to spend a moment thinking about people in prison, many of whom are also avid gardeners, either they've discovered it in prison through our program, uh, or they have um, gardened you know, prior to their incarceration. But I want to bring it up specifically because one thing that people in prison who garden have told us over and over is that this contact with nature and with plants is so vital to understanding the passage of time in an institution, especially in a place where you may be cut off from typical milestones, uh, ways to mark the passage of time. Over and over again, uh, students in our programs have told us that the garden helps keep them grounded, literally and figuratively, in the passage of time and in a sense of shared land and shared responsibility. The New Garden Society has been uh, providing horticulture education, garden installation, therapeutic green space, and vocational connections to the green industry for incarcerated people in greater Boston uh, for 10 years. We're celebrating our first complete decade of work uh, in 2024. We engage horticulture as a transformative tool. Uh, we see our gardens in prisons as restorative. Uh, we're constantly innovating and working on different ways we can make them uh, safe uh, and instructive places for people who are incarcerated in Massachusetts. So uh, we're passionate about uh, working in prisons, uh, specifically in, in this nation, because we have such a high rate uh, of, of prisoners in our population. You can see here, um, this is a 2015 statistic, uh, but we're we're really uh, we're really above a lot of other countries in terms of how many people we incarcerate. So many and many of our neighbors uh, are incarcerated, and most of us, uh, nationally speaking, will know someone uh, who's incarcerated. We think that horticulture is part of the answer for prison gardens because it takes advantage of a resource that's already there, the state land that the prison is sitting on, uh, and uh, leverages goodwill, donations, and volunteer uh, efforts from local green industry experts who are coming in every week to teach folks about gardening. Um, and again, while this is an educational and vocational program, we found that the therapeutic aspects are really important as well. Um, therapeutic horticulture is, according to the Horticulture Society of New York, an ancient practice that uses plants and gardens as tools in human healing and rehabilitation. Its benefits include stress reduction, mood improvement, alleviation of depression, social growth, physical and mental rehabilitation, wellness, and vocational training. 
Um, again, these are all benefits that are in very short supply in prison settings. I won't, I, I won't go into detail on all of these, but I wanted to give a few examples of concrete ways we see this horticulturist therapy in action in our gardens. Um, creating beautiful spaces, increasing physical activity and time outdoors. Students have told us that it gives us something um, uh, to share with family members when they come to visit or call on the phone, uh, a discussion that one might have with uh, a family member when you want to talk about something that's not about uh, incarceration or being in jail. Uh, it just provides, as it provides for all of us, uh, the garden provides um, a space where, where we can connect um, outside of some of the other uh, boundaries that we might commonly run up against. We also think that horticulture is an excellent field for returning citizens. You can see here a quote from one of our students who says, the skills I learn here apply for the rest of my life on the inside and outside. I like the fresh vegetables best, but the skills are important too. Helps me get along and work as a team, teaches me a job I could do. Um, and they certainly say it best. Uh, everything from the community atmosphere in our garden program to the opportunity to access fresh produce, which is in very scarce supply in carceral settings, um, is, is, is really valued uh, by our participants. These are some other reasons horticulture can be a welcoming environment for returning citizens. Um, often a driver's license is not required unless it's a, a specific part of the job. Uh, it's a, a, a stable kind of position throughout economic recessions. Uh, there, as long as the knowledge base is there, advanced degrees are often not required. Um, and it's accessible in a range of environments. So when people are leaving incarceration and thinking about where they can return and thrive, the green industry is um, almost always an option for them should they have an interest in it. Um, so why garden clubs, right? We've talked about why gardens and why prisons. Uh, we've loved uh, the opportunities we've already had to share our work in garden clubs across Massachusetts and we're actively seeking more. Uh, we give standalone um, lectures or seminars uh, that can be uh, that can take place in person or online. And these are some of the features that I think are most valuable to the garden clubs that have hosted us previously. Um, we're able to listen together and share sense memories and stories from prison gardens, images like some of the ones you've seen here, and words from our students stories from our educators, discuss practical ways that shared land connects us to shared futures. This is a lesson we're learning over and over in our 10 years of programming. Um, and it can also inspire, I think, gardeners uh, at every level of expertise to think about new collaborations with a wider community of plant stewards and what it means, especially in the age of climate change, to put these skills into the hands of a, a larger and larger group of people and to share our knowledge uh, in as wide a network as possible, including facilities where uh, sharing information is not necessarily the norm. I'll close with a quote from one of our students who says the program changed them. Uh, they say, I better be out there and water the flowers than be in the block or better than being miserable. It's enjoyable not to think about anything else. It takes you out of the mindset of being in this place. It frees me. Um, we're so eager to share this work in more detail in your garden clubs this season. And we're also very open uh, and excited to potentially collaborate in the future. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Let's move on to Suzanne Faith. Welcome. I'm not. Oh, I'm a little. Can you can you all yes. see me? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, hey, that, no. sometimes a glitch happens. <laughs> oh, you know what? Well, this is probably apropos for my presentation anyway, because um, my vocation, not that I want to say this about Carol or anybody, but my vocation is actually, uh, my entire career has been spent in the as a dementia specialist. However, my avocation 
mention is that I am an international award-winning press floral artist. And 20 years ago, when I was teaching floral design in Japan, I came across some information that was given to me from the company I was working with that had just recently aired on their NHK television. And they said that flowers are good for your health. So they came to me and they said, would you write a book? And my initial thought was, no, I don't really understand it as a medical professional. I can't be writing a book on something I don't understand. So that started me on a 20 year search of just combing the internet and doing research on what is it about flowers that we're all attracted to? And how is it that flowers can improve our health, improve our emotional well-being, um, improve our cognition. And so I come to I put all that information finally in a book that I wrote called Flowering Your Mind. And what I'd like to do now as I'm ending beginning to end my medical career and go back to my true love, which is working with flowers, is to bring to you that information and bring to your, your garden club members the information as to why flowers are important to our health and why the brain responds to flowers. And no, it's not pressed flowers per se, because initially I thought pressed flowers, how could that be? They Once they're pressed, the vital life force is removed from them. So what is it about flowers? And it's actually not a pressed flower. It could be a flower in your garden. It could be a painting of a flower. It could be a doodle of your flower of flowers that you do while you're on the phone or something. But it is the actual connotation that flowers bring to the brain that floods it with positive um, life force and that combined with creating whether you're creating a design or working in the garden or painting flowers it is all positive so during my presentation to to clubs and I've done this in a lot of memory care assisted livings but I thought what better than to bring it to people that already love flowers and need perhaps some justification as to why they're spending so much time with their flowers um, is to have you experience flowers, have you experience color, see what colors you gravitate towards, what colors in combination are more appropriate to perhaps creating a arrangement or a garden for relaxation versus an arrangement for stimulation and how we can utilize colors for these different things, what colors we want to avoid. Um, and so it's a wonderful presentation. And I think it's a new aspect that people are just beginning to really see the benefit of how flowers can be incorporated into our lives and should be incorporated into our lives to bring us a lot of joy. There's so much research in the book, um, which I also talk about in my presentation. I'm happy to do the presentation virtually, but it's always so much better to be able to be in person and have people experience the, the flowers and with me and we work together and see how creating these arrangements with different colors actually does have a difference in how your brain responds and how you emotionally feel after you're looking at the creation. So um, my information is on the Garden Club website uh, in the Mayflower catalog, I believe. I have a website of my own, natureofdesign.com, and you're welcome to contact me if this is something you would be interested or you believe your garden club members would be interested in learning about. Um, so thank you for having me this morning, and I think that's it. I didn't have much time to give you my pitch, but 
hopefully you will respond to it, enjoy it, and invite me. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, next up would be Karen Hawkinson. Karen? Hello. Hi, Karen. I can see you. Great. There you go. All right. So hello, everyone. I'm Karen Hawkinson. I'm manager of the Massachusetts Master Gardener Speakers Bureau. We offer speakers for your events as part of our organization's mission to share gardening and horticultural practice. So thanks so much for this opportunity to talk with you again. And I'd like to offer five reasons why we're a great option for your club. So the first reason is our experience. Uh, we've been providing speakers for close to 20 years and we present over 120 lectures every year. Reason number two is our speakers. All our speakers are certified master gardeners. They have years of experience and hands-on knowledge, and many also have advanced degrees in horticulture and related topics. Reason number three is that we have a wide range of topics. We currently have 53 different presentations and they're grouped in seven categories that range from gardening basics to specific plant species, from indoor to outdoor gardening topics, and from vegetable to ornamental gardening. There's really something for everyone. You can find the full list of 53 topics on our website. In addition, we are enlarging our offerings on an ongoing basis. Here's a list of the presentations that we added just this past year. Ground covers, creating an eco-friendly urban garden, hydrangea peas and cues, stop and smell the lilacs, companion planting in the vegetable and herb garden, ditch the dirt, simple DIY hydroponic growing, creating pollinator habitat anywhere, gardening water wisdom, save water, the environment and money, spiders, the most misunderstood garden protector, and the holistic approach to gardening. Reason number four is that we're an affordable option. The cost for a Master Gardener Speaker Bureau presentation is $225. Reason number five is that we have a full service approach. Our presentations include a one hour lecture plus time for questions and answers. Most include handouts and all our presentations are available in both in-person and via Zoom. If you'd like to schedule a presentation, just email me at this uh, email address, which is also on our website. Let me know the topic you're interested in, the potential dates and times, and I can check speaker availability. If a speaker is available, I'll do all the contracting and you'll be all set to go. So thanks for this opportunity to talk with you. Please get in touch with me at uh, this website address, and I look forward to hearing from you. Oh, thank you very much, Karen. I am. All right, Stacy Lee, welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stacy Lee. I use they them pronouns. Um, I am the uh, I am a seasonal florist, a sustainability advocate, and a peony farmer. Um, I own and operate Peonia Designs. It's a wedding events and retail floor shop. Been doing that about uh, 12 years. And right now I'm taking a hiatus to work on my lecture series and farming um, and freelancing for friends. So um, I am a lifelong gardener. I have worked in uh, commercial greenhouses, organic greenhouses, peony farms, from New Jersey to Alaska. Um, and I have my own peonies growing in my garden that were my grandmother's and they're over 60 years old. So to say I love flowers is an understatement. Um, I specialize in low impact and sustainable floral design. Um, I have two uh, presentations for garden clubs. One is my sustainable floristry uh, presentations. They are live demonstrations where I use local, regional, and American grown flowers um, in uh, low impact and uh, alternatives to sustainable flower foam. Um, I introduce your garden club to things like 
um, AgriWolf. This is actually a grow pod, which is really fun for gardeners to use. Um, I introduced things like the Ocean Pouch, which was made by a woman in Sudbury, and things like the Holly Chapel Pillow. When I go through how to use all these different design mechanics um, and where to source them from. Um, I also partner with a farm local to your garden club that offers either a CSA or um, a weekly farm share. Um, as all the flowers are local, it's nice if you can find your own um, in your backyard. Um, I, uh, sorry. My uh, lectures can go from one hours to three hours, depending upon um, how much of a workshop you want to do, how many flowers you want to have involved. But my typical lectures are 60 to 90 minutes. Um, I also give sustainable peony growing uh, workshops only during the month of June. During the month of June, I work at a local peony farm and I manage the harvest of 2000 plants. So giving a talk in June allows me to bring lots of different varieties and things to smell and touch and ask questions. Um, I go through planting, plant maintenance, harvesting, storage, um, and everything in, uh, involved with the peony. Um, it is my, my favorite flower um, for lots of different reasons. And it's not in season right now, but we do have lots of other things available. Um, it is March. And um, even though we don't have peonies available, there are gorgeous flowers that you can get that are both local and American grown. These ranunculus came from Virgil Greenhouses in Ontario, Canada. They are driven to the wholesaler in a truck in some water. So that's a much more sustainable option than these garden roses, which were grown in California and flown on a plane. So although both are American grown, or what both both are local, regional, American grown, there are choices that you can make um, even in seasons like this, these bumper seasons. Um, and during the, uh, during the both types of presentations, I make um, floral arrangements for people to take home, to come, to touch, to ask questions, to sniff. And there is a lot of beauty available pretty close by for March. Um, after my presentations, I provide attendees in the garden clubs with the sourcing packets that outline both the flowers and the foliages, where I get them, who you need to talk to, um, contact information. I also provide all the links to all of the sustainable sources um, of mechanics and um, design. Everybody will have that after the talk so that nobody has to take notes during the talk. Um, if you'd like to reach out, um, my email is on the website and my name is Stacy and it's at peoniadesigns.com. And that is me. Thank you very much, Stacy. Next, Tova Martin. Tova, welcome. There you are. Mm -hmm. Well, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, my name is Tova Martin, and I um, lecture throughout New England, both live and Zoom. I have a couple of new lectures. I have many lectures on my website, but I'm going to focus on my two new ones now. Uh, first one is um, Issues and Answers, Harnessing Plants to Solve Problems. So, um, the, all my lectures are photographed at my own home, and um, which is in um, Western Connecticut. And I um, photograph my own slides. So they're all very unique. I don't um, just put up web, web slides for my lectures. And it's really fun to invite you all back to my seven acre, to invite you virtually to my seven acre garden. Um, so I take issues like very, very dry soil that's sort of hard pan by the road and tell you about what you can grow there. Things like the beautiful native Baptisia. And I have experience with all these things and I can offer you hints and little tidbits about how to keep voles from pestering your plants. So um, I also take plants out that, so that was dry and and rocky, and this is wet and um and and sort of meadowland. So something like Joe Pieweed, 
would do really, really well. And then I have ideas for taking your uh, plants that might repel deer and, um, and rabbits from your garden. So surrounding your garden with plants that solve the issue of things that eat your garden. So plants like feverfew and the herbal rue that s smell very fetid do things like that. And then I take, uh, because I am a writer and I write a lot of garden columns and uh, write for many magazines. I'm also an author as well as a photographer and a goat herd. But um, so I do a lot of research and talk to, to people that are researching all the time. And I so I learn things, very, very current research, like that members of the sunflower family are so great for bee issues, uh, diseases, et cetera, that bother bees. So um, I incorporate that sort of information into every lecture I do, really a lot of research, and but also things that I've learned as a hands-on gardener from digging in the dirt and working all the time with my garden and observing. So those are all incorporated into all my lectures, but especially into my new issues and answers. Another, I am an indoor gardener, so another lecture would be bringing the outdoors inside your home and onto your windowsill. So I do a lot of lectures about houseplants. I have over 200 houseplants in my own home and I specialize in them. And so I talk about, not only about gardening indoors, but also how you can give the sense of the garden outdoors into your home. Um, you're located in Massachusetts, so you have a long period of time where you can't garden outside. Bring it in, bring it into your home. So this is taking something like the forest, your concept of the forest and bringing it in taking the grasslands and taking that concept and bringing it into your house. So I talked to you about making composition gardens that look like the outdoors and how exactly to do it and plants that work and really thrive in your home um, and how to make them happen. So they're practical, but I try very hard to make them beautiful. And one of my main focuses is about taking containers and making even the container part of it very, very beautiful. So I make compositions such as this using the saxifrage and the um, mondo grass from outside and bringing them into your home so that it looks, feels like a garden, even putting, tucking that little bit of honeycomb in to make it feel like a garden indoors. And really, everybody in the family loves it. I mean, it's just one of those feel-good things. Um, this is Einstein, who is my um, co-gardener indoors. So um, he helps out an awful lot, especially with the um, bounce and stress testing for all my plants. So um, all my lectures have these components to them. So... I also have lectures on easiest house plant ever with style. And I have in unison, creating a harmonious garden for pollinators and you. I have lots of lectures on my website, both about indoor gardening and outdoor gardening. So I hope that you will all consider contacting me. And um, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Tova. Um, next, Nadine Mazzola. Nadine. Hi, wonderful. I'm not going to share a PowerPoint presentation. Um, do I am I on speaker? I mean, a uh, big screen so that's working. Yep, lovely background. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mm-hmm. Hello, I'm Nadine Mazzola. I'm a certified forest therapy guide and an author, and excuse me, an author. And um, I love to share the practice of forest bathing with garden clubs. I offer both talks and in-person experiences. And forest bathing is a wellness practice that supports our health, um, our healing, our well-being, but also forest bathing encourages us to grow our relationships with plants and the spaces that we tend and we love to be in. The practice originates from Japan. So during my talks, I will often share some of the history about it. I will share some of the, the health benefits. So share how it's different than some of the other practices we might know, like mindfulness and different other things we can do outside. And then I also share about how to do it and what it includes. Um, and let's see, what else do I wanna share? Um, I always like to include in my talks, I always like to include an experiential segment too, so that even if it's virtual or it's a, a talk in person, but indoors, that we're able to have some time really experiencing what it's like and people can feel that for themselves. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about sharing this with clubs is actually forest bathing is a practice when done together with a group like a club or folks that work together is it can really build relationships and some camaraderie and it's an experience you can have together. So in addition to talks either offered virtually or in person, I also offer in-person forest bathing experiences to clubs. And I'd say it's about 50-50 what um, folks like to have me do. Half of the time I'm doing an in-person walk or workshop and half of the time I'm doing a lecture. And this is often the kind of space that we might be in if we were doing an outdoor um, forest bathing event together. It's often close to home Um, a place that we pick together that will work and be accessible for the group. And often uh, in-person experience, they're they're usually about 120 minutes. And um, we start with um, some information about the practice and what we're doing. We do a variety of forest bathing experiences. We end with a forest tea party in the forest. And then for those that want to linger, there's time to um, linger and do question and answer and just learn more about the practice. For both my talks and in-person events, I follow up with resources, uh, handouts that folks can get on my website if they'd like. Um, Just a little bit more about me. I've been a certified forest therapy guide since 2015. Um, I've been a gardener my whole life. Um, And I'm also an author. I wrote a book, uh, an award-winning book on horse bathing with your dog. Many of us like have dogs and love to walk with them. And it's a little bit about how to do this practice while also spending time out um, with your with your beloved pet. Um, I also have done workshops um, for quite a few years at the New England Botanic Garden. I've been there since 2016. I uh, work with Mass Hort. Um, I also have presented for multiple garden clubs. I've been on TV a couple times in the Windows to the Wild show with Willem Lang talking about forest bathing and talking about forest bathing with your dog in New England Chronicle and have also appeared in different magazines and newspapers. I, if you're this is a kind of experience that you'd like to have for your club or to learn about the practice of forest bathing, I would really love to share this practice. It's my passion these days and this point in my life, it's just something I really love to share with people. So I hope you'll reach out to me. My contact information is in the advertisement um, that you clicked through to get access to this video, I believe. And my email is nadine.mazzola at gmail.com, or you can give me a call. And I hope you'll check out my website to learn more about me. And I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sally. I'm sorry. Uh, 
Nadine. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Sally Muspratt, our next speaker. Hello, I'm Sally. It's a pleasure to speak with you about my talks. This year, Lynn Hoyt and Betsy Howard have made this program workshop even better. The online format has great advantages. It allows speakers to create more focused presentations and it reaches a much larger audience. But frankly, I still miss the excitement in the in-person workshops at Elm Bank and Tower Hill. Meeting the new Garden Club program chairman and catching up with other speakers was really fun. And I much prefer speaking to clubs in person, though I occasionally give Zoom presentations. When I meet your members and see their faces, I can adjust my tone and timing according to their reactions. The give and take of their asking and my responding to questions makes a lively personal exchange, much more interesting than a one-way lecture. Program chairmen sometimes ask, which is my favorite program? Today, it's Secret Gardens. I created this program last year at the suggestion of the Wollaston Garden Club program chairman. For this three club event, the members transformed the hall with table decorations and refreshments using secret garden themes. I know that the club's involvement in creating their beautiful flowery bowers and key shaped cookies was the primary reason for the success of the evening. But I really like the talk, and I'm eager to see how it goes when it stands alone. These descriptions of my programs are only templates. Retiring from my design practice frees up time for the luxury of tailoring each presentation to the interests that the program chairman who invites me says will be best for her group. Some clubs are more interested in the hands-on gardening aspect of the topic, others in learning about landscape history and design, and I can make those changes in advance. Here's the first program I'll discuss, New Uses for Annuals. In the 19th century, annuals were wildly popular novelties. Today, they're too often seen as a cheap fix for gardeners whose perennials didn't come back. This reevaluation shows situations where they're by far the best first choice. Difficult growing conditions, places where bright color is needed, and when one wants to experiment inexpensively with new color combinations. Raised beds and beyond, This talk moves a sh moves a short from a short history of raised beds to inspirational images of very different types of edging materials and illustrates technical information on construction and soil mixtures. We discuss designing with earth shaping techniques from mounding beds without frames to making gentle or highly dramatic berms. Creating personal space from backyard to garden. We explore different ways to create a place where you can be your own best self. Starting with defining as precisely as possible what you want and evaluating what improvements you can make with your existing conditions we proceed to design tool, tools and plant lists you can use to make your dream a reality. And Les Quatre Vents, Frank Cabot's Northern Garden, we walk through the masterpiece of the founder of the Garden Conservancy, following his own joyous choreographed route through contrasting garden rooms. Many of his techniques can be just, can be used at home.
For more about these talks, go to the lecture page of my website, smmgardens.com. Click on the first item, my 2023 program talk, for a detailed illustrated account of my talks. Do get in touch if you're interested in my speaking to your club. I love giving these talks. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne. Welcome, Joanne. Fabulous. Thank you. My voice is a little weird because I have a cold, so I'm sorry about that. Um, oops. Now I have to go back into my program. Okay, I want to first give you a little bit of my um, bio. And again, I'm sorry about my voice being this way. Um, I was a practicing landscape architect in the state of Massachusetts for 12 years, and I've been doing photography for about 25. So to each one of my presentations, I bring both of those backgrounds together. Um, I'm going to start off with my presentation, Garden Designer Deeper Dive. And because it was a landscape architect, I look at um, the entire package when you're um, looking at your landscape. So it's not just about planting. It's about the functionality of your yard, the things that you don't have that you'd like to have, all of that. I talk about bubble diagrams, planning. I use as examples um, gardens um, across the U.S. and in Europe. So they're to inspire you. And then I talk about how you can bring some of these details, especially when you're looking at a garden like that, into your own landscape and for your own budget. I look at softscape, hardscape. So this is the surface pathways. How do you get from point A to point B? Uh, vertical features, focal points, both living and man-made. Uh, we look at color, briefly at color. Um, repetition, which is actually a very good thing. And I talk about views from your house. Don't just think um, just once you're outside. And maintenance and how much money you have for maintenance, how much time you want to spend maintaining. My only presentation that's about plant specific is fragrance in the garden. Um, I first talk about what scent the VOCs do for the plants in their survival. It's absolutely fascinating. But of course, the byproduct of, of VOCs that help the plant survival is that we get to enjoy the plants. Um, because I've made this mistake before, I'm very careful about, I have a section about plant classification and botanical names. So you don't go out and buy what you think is going to be a flower that has scent, but you actually bought the wrong flower because you went by the common name, not the botanical name. We look at um, trees, shrubs, and flowers. And some might surprise you. And herbs. And placement of these fragrant plants so that you can get the maximum enjoyment um, at your own property. And that's actually, I'm sitting at this table right now as I'm doing this presentation. Then I have my Gorgeous Gardens in New England series. Right now I have four in the series. I'm adding a fifth. So these are, with each one, the handout that you get is this map with the approximate locations of where the gardens are. So should you decide to go to some of these gardens, you kind of have a general um, idea of where they are. And when I start for each new garden, they're usually 10 to 12 in each presentation. Um, I have what comes up on the screen is, the, excuse me, the name of the garden and where it's located. Um, this happens to be Glen Magna, one of my favorite gardens. I talk about in these, the history of the gardens, the history of the gardeners, um, the families that were there. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, and I talk a little bit about design. I have some historical drawings in there. So you're gonna see some historical um, or photographs of the gardens and then the actual garden space, how it, how it might exist now, which I find very interesting. These are the famous blue steps at Namkeeg that are over here. And these are some of the working drawings for them. Something as a landscape architect, I was very familiar with working drawings, the magnificent blue garden. And then creating beautiful garden photographs. Um, I love it. After every one of my presentations, the comment I got get most commonly is your photography is beautiful. Um, to me, it's not just about the beauty of the garden, but that for all of my presentations, any point that I'm making, it's very um, beautifully, but um, photographed in a way you can see every detail that I want you to see. So what I share with you, I'm a 35 millimeter photographer, I always have been. 
Um, I'm not a big fan of iPhones, but things that I share with you are it's composition. It's moving to another location when you're photographing instead of head on on the sunflower. Wow, what if I walk around the sunflower and look at that? It's fabulous. It looks like it's got movement to it. So it's getting you to approach photography from a photographer's standpoint, from not just doing the static, the one shot, you walk in a garden, there it is. And I'm just going to stand there. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to scooch down so I can get a picture of something that's a low growing um, plant. It's getting the details, getting the background here. This is it, um, the Von Trapp. Uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the inn that's in Stowe, Vermont. It's the Von Trapp family. So the setting is so important here. So it's capturing that garden, capturing where you are. Just different techniques that I use. You can do these with an iPhone. Much better off. You've got much better control with a 35 millimeter, but it's things that you can apply to your own photography if you're only using an iPhone. So the two new, I'm going to end with the two new programs that I have. Um, they're both garden travel. This one is the Hudson River Valley, Long Island, and Northern New Jersey. And so in the Hudson River Valley, a lot of the um, places that we'll look at are, you know, the Roosevelts and the big families and the names, and they're absolutely stunning and magnificent. So I'll talk a little about the history of these. We'll get a lot of shots of the garden design of some of the details. Um, some of them are going to be those gardens where you'll be very familiar with who was the owner of the original garden, the, the garden landscape. But some of them, this is in New Jersey. This is in the back of um, a municipal building. And it's these kinds of gardens that I love to find and share with people that kind of they're the hidden gardens, the ones you might not know. Um, George Washington did not. Well, he probably did sleep here, but this was his headquarters at one point. This is in northern New Jersey. Uh, there are two gardens on Long Island that I just visited last spring that are absolutely stunning, spectacular. Get a couple of shots of these. And now, ironically, we're going to see this. Well, keep that in mind for a minute. So I was in England. I had the great fortune to go to England um, this past fall with a friend of mine. We went to the Cotswolds, Cornwall, and Devon. We had a car. And this presentation, there are 11 gardens. And in some of them, this is Castle Drogo. Um, I give you a feeling what's it like in some of these, um, where the gardens are, where they're attached to some magnificent castle or mansion. Again, some historic pictures. This is Grenaria. Um, there are I, I was stunned actually to see this. And I was also st stunned by the different variety of the gardens in this part of England. Because of the climate, they have all these tropical plants there. So this was Ganera from, I can't read right now what date that was when they were brought here. But um, this is one of the um, gardens, this is Morab Garden with amazing tropical plants, a sculpture garden that is absolutely phenomenal. The Tate owns this, although it's not in London. And the in the Cotswolds, I have cousins who live there half the year in England. They've been doing this for years now since they retired. And when I was asking her, you know, do you have gardens to recommend the areas we're going to be going to? And she said, well, anywhere in the Cotswolds, it's a garden everywhere. And that was really um, what I found there. I think we can get a lot of inspiration from what the people in England do, how they use their vertical space. And I illustrate that a lot in this presentation. Um, I do include um, maps. That I so that you kind of get an idea of the overall feel of the garden if I'm only concentrating in one area of a garden. And this is this is Hidcut. Um, I've heard it pronounced many different ways, um, but one of the most famous gardens in this part of England. Uh, this is a town, Padstow, and there is the most amazing. This is a Rococo garden. It's the only extant Rococo garden. So as you can see, there are all these different designs that I'll share with you from um, gardens of this part of England. So. There's my contact information. Um, I have a website, which you can go to, which also shows some of the other photography work um, that I do, but there's a section on gardens and that. And I hope to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. You're welcome. We have now uh, Neil Sanders. Neil, welcome. I'm here, yes. Good, I see you. Okay, can, can you see me the, the way yes. you should? Okay, mm -hmm. all right. I'm not sharing the screen, just doing this live. Okay. Okay, ready to begin. Hi, my name is Neil Sanders, and for the past dozen years, I've proven that horticulture and humor can go hand in hand. I've spoken to more than 700 organizations, mostly in New England, but 
increasingly across the country. What I offer your club is a spouse's point of view of gardening, one filled with humor and insight from someone who gardens both because of an abiding love of horticulture as well as for the love of a spouse. I guarantee your members will leave with a better appreciation of what's going on in the minds of their helpmates. My talks are good for all seasons, but I get a lot of requests for spouses night, member recruitment, open meetings, and open and annual luncheons when clubs want something a little lighter. Most of you know me for Gardening is Murder, in which I cover topics such as why so much gardening advice on the internet is awful, why you should never compute the value of your gardening labor, and why it requires digging three holes to plant something. I also offer proof that wildlife doesn't watch Walt Disney movies. If you've never had me to your club, or it's been a long time since I've been there, start with that presentation. If your club enjoyed Gardening is Murder, then they'll love Gardening is Painless and Other Lies We Tell Ourselves. It's the same format, moves from the same rich vein of drawn from real life humor. I cover revelations such as rock walls continue to grow until they consume all available building material. I provide reasons why you should never hesitate to pay a delivery charge for a tree or why you should never enable a gardener. Why slinkies won't stop squirrels from raiding your feeder and why giving a flower show ticket to a gardener can be injurious to your back. This year I have a new program. It's called Create Your Very Own Hometown National Park. And it tells the true story of two people, both of them on social security, who did no, no one in their right mind should ever undertake at any age, build from scratch a half acre pollinator friendly native plant garden that contains not a square inch of grass. My wife, Betty, who is a lifetime master gardener, designed it. The two of us planted it beginning in 2015 and we continue to maintain and expand it. The phrase hometown national park was coined by naturalist Doug Tallamy and it describes a landscape that provides a home for desirable species yet is usable by, by humans. My talk describes how our garden was conceived and executed and how it has evolved as it matures. All of this told is, is told with considerable humor and is fueled by ibuprofen. When her schedule permits, Betty accompanies me in order to point out all the inaccuracies of what I'm saying and offer the correct version of events. My speaking fee is $200. If that seems suspiciously low, it's because I'm having fun doing all this and I have an ulterior motive, which is to attract new readers to my writing. And yes, I've written 15 mysteries, most of which revolve around garden clubs, horticulture, and women of a certain age. I impose no travel fee if you live with me on an hour's drive of my home in Medfield. I'll close with a quote of a note I received last May from the president of the Springfield Civic Garden Club. It's the largest garden club in Illinois. The comments we received from Gardening is Murder were resounding. You're the best speaker we've had in years. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Neil. Uh, next is Michelle Frank Schuckel. Michelle, welcome. Hey. I'm Michelle Frank Schuckel. I am a certified master gardener and I offer innovative programming to garden clubs on all sorts of different topics um, with a focus on sustainability and um, living uh, a balanced mm -hmm. and healthy life in and out of the garden. I, um, sorry. I am a little bit about me, just so you know a little bit more what you're getting into if you bring me to your club. Um, I am a certified master gardener. Like I said, I've been gardening with native plants uh, since well before it was hip, probably uh, almost 20 years now. Um, and I'm a public health nurse. So I think about how um, I can foster health and well being of the gardener as well as the environment. Um, I would consider myself curious, uh, engaging always present and always grateful for the opportunity to be in the garden um, and to be learning something new. What motivates me is really a passion about the art and science of gardening and seeking and teaching balance and well-being um, for everybody. Um, more than ever, I think opportunities to connect people like we have with our garden clubs um, is so, so incredibly important. And um, I really am so grateful to be able to be a teacher and a student um, a family member and a steward of whatever small piece of our wonderful um, New England gardens that I can. Um, I currently am a garden designer and um, I sort of balance that with my public health nursing. And what that gives me is an opportunity to always have um, the latest information and um, sort of being aware and constantly up to date on the newest information, um, newest reading, newest research. Um, so I offer a combination of lectures and programs um, really designed for all kinds of clubs because I know we have a broad spectrum of, of interest, um, whether we're dedicated gardeners, um, folks who like to arrange lifestyle clubs or something in between. 
Um, so examples of the lectures I offer where um, you can find all this detail on my website um, include the cut flowers journey from ground to vase, um, gardening in a changing climate. We'll talk about how to have a sustainable garden no matter the dramatic weather that comes forward for us. Uh, mindfulness and well-being for the aging gardener, because certainly um, our own sustainability and ability to be present and healthy in our gardens is incredibly important. Um, I have a field to fork program where we talk about the horticulture of the food we eat and any proceeds from that lecture are donated to combat food insecurity. Um, my most popular lecture remains native plants. Um, and I talk about not only why native plants are important and how to think about native plants, but how to incorporate them into your yard um, and yes, you can have native plants and non-native plants um, and trees are the key there um, in terms of sustainability and our positive impact. Um, we talk about what the quiet season is like in the winter in the yard. I have a program on pruning, uh, removing the mystery where we can actually go into a garden and do some pruning or stay in and do a sort of a lecture type, um, depending on what a club is looking for and um, weed ID, what the weeds are saying and how to listen. And that, that actually is a program that um, was requested by a club. And um, I, that's a great example of just me generating something. If you have something you're looking for, we can talk about it and I can make it happen. Um, so I also offer, in addition to lectures, creative demonstrations and engaging workshops, including things like everyday centerpieces. So simple centerpieces using, uh, using items from around your home to bring beauty to your table. Um, so you feel free to join the party or the celebration when you gather friends. Uh, composting is another one um, that's really moved from being about creating food for your plants to really um, thinking about how you can recycle your own um, solid ways to decrease the amount of trash on your own property. Um, I actually am a certified home compost instructor. Um, the Botany of Beverages is a great couples event. We talk about the history of, um, of all the drinks we, we drink, whether they're alcoholic or not. Um, Winter Blooms is a great one. That's a work, really nice workshop or demonstration. We'll use paper whites and amaryllis. Uh, I'll do Yankee containers for sun and shade. Uh, so considering perennials and natives in woven into containers uh, rather than just the standard annuals, which is typical for lots of us. And um, homemade wreaths and swags where we can create um, either and talk about the history of those things um, in those uh, holiday celebrations. So um, this slide just gives a little more information about how to reach me. Um, I'm happy to do Zoom or um, uh, in-person programming. I tend to be flexible for whatever anyone's looking for. Um, this past winter, I've done a number of Zoom um, or hybrid talks for folks who have some snowbirds who still wanna stay connected to the club. And those have worked out well. I do offer opportunity drawings and handouts if you like. I am professional organized and experienced and I will do day or evening programs. And like I mentioned earlier, custom programs. Um, so you could scan the QR code on the screen with your camera on your cell phone to go right to my website or go to naturalselectionsgardens.com and see all of the programming information and reach out to me there. Thanks so much. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Michelle. And now we have Betsy and um, Betsy, I don't want to try to pronounce your last name. So I'm going to let you say it yourself. It's Simzak. Uh, Okay, thank you. Say it again, please. Simzak. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, again, participate in this uh, workshop. I think it's a great opportunity for us to be able to share what we do uh, in terms of our garden uh, passions. Um, as you can see, my garden passions are, are started out with begonias and then it went to dahlias, and it's gone to a lot of other things, um, and we'll hopefully uh, talk about a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah you're all set. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, very involved with a number of organizations. Uh, I'm a National Garden Club Garden Consultant, a Massachusetts uh, Principal Master Gardener, uh, I'm a member of the uh, Begonia, Gisneriad, and Dia Societies. I'm a certified judge for all of those societies. Um, and I'm currently studying to be a National Garden Club Flower Show judge, which takes a long time and a lot of jumping through hoops, but it's been very, very uh, informative and interesting. I uh, 
have programs that uh, in person or Zoom, they're between 45 and 60 minutes, an uh, interactive PowerPoint. I usually bring a two-page um, PowerPoint, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, handout. Um, my in-person lectures will involve demonstration plants. I usually, if I'm talking about begonias, will give away three or four begonia plants. I talk about dahlias, I'll give away tubers. Uh, and uh, I do do some hands-on workshops if that's of interest. Uh, so my begonia presentations are a begonia for any season. This is the one that's most popular where I talk about the very diverse group of plants. But if you really are interested in begonias as foliage and as house plants, um, I have a program called Fancy Leaf Begonias. I'm actually presenting this program at Avant Gardens in Dartmouth on Saturday. And then of course, if you really wanna get into how to grow and show a blue ribbon begonia, I've got a program for that too. Um, uh, these are, this is a lovely little uh, terrarium begonia that's really only about three inches tall. Uh, these are begonias that make uh, interesting flowers. Uh, my dahlia presentations, uh, my most popular dahlia presentation is gardening with dahlias. But when you garden with dahlias, it's a four season endeavor. And you might say with the, it's summer and fall, but there's a lot to think about in uh, winter and spring. Uh, so I uh, have uh, five dahlia programs. That's my dahlia garden in October. And I've recently developed a, a plant propagation workshop. It's called Plant Parenthood. Uh, I've done this on Zoom. I'm going to be doing it live. It's kind of a hands-on program. I'm actually doing this program for the uh, Buxton branch of the American Begonia Society in a month, where I talk about uh, essentially vegetative propagation. Those are echeverias, not begonias, but I had to slip this in somewhere. Uh, we talk about all the methods of uh, propagating begonias. And then uh, recently, uh, I developed a program on pollen, pollinators, and plants. There's an awful lot of discussion about pollinators and pollinator gardens, but a lot of people don't really understand the whole process of what pollen is, where it comes from, why it's important. So I talk about that, and then I talk about my personal experience trying to um, encourage these uh, insects and pollinators in my garden. And finally, um, I have become a bit of a flower show aficionado. In the past 28 days, I've been to four flower shows to Seattle, Philadelphia, um, and um, uh, the bulb show at um, Smith College and uh, the Connecticut show. And uh, I thought that people might be interested in hearing what makes a flower show a flower show, who can enter, enter what you can enter. And uh, hopefully uh, by the end of May, I'll have pictures of a bucket list trip uh, where I will be going to the Chelsea Flower Show in London. I have a, also a program on holiday floral design. This is the result of a trip to the White House, both in 2016 and 2023. Uh, this is a holiday program I've done for a couple of garden clubs that want something not too heavy duty, something sort of interesting and holiday themed. And that's it. Uh, I'll have a Mayflower ad. Uh, you can reach me at this Gmail. There's a lot of consonants in my last name. So um, <laughs> maybe the phone number might be a little bit more helpful. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Betsy. Um, Kristen Torkelson. Kristen, welcome. My name is Kristen Torkelson, and I'm a professional photographer um, with a passion for nature and um, in specific gardens and flowers and butterflies. Um, so one of the things that people always came to me is how do you take such good photographs? Well, I can take them using my cell phone or my um, SLR or, you know, little point and shoot. It's more about um, intent and what you want to do next. Okay, so um, one of my like my most popular um, programs is available in two formats. It's how to take a better photo photograph, no matter what kind of camera you're using. It is only available in person because there's a lot of demonstrations involved. Um, but they, it is often in two formats. One is a lecture, which is um, perfect for larger groups, and then another is a um, workshop. I just need to 
ooh, where people's faces are. There we go. So now I can see my notes. <laughs> um, the other one is a, um, a workshop, which can either be given as part of the regular club meeting or um, it can be done at a club member's garden like I did in Natick a few years ago. So um, to take a better photograph, you need to ask yourself, what story do I want to tell? And knowing why you're taking your photograph um, will help you focus and identify the main subject. So um, if I do a workshop, um, this was actually done at um, the um, Temple Shalom um, in yeah, just last okay. night, so I'm a little tired. <laughs> um, him, but this is him. what some of the workups that um setups that I'll bring with me. So this is um a reflection and that um image. And the tent is over it, so you're not seeing um pictures of ceiling tiles being reflected in your pictures. Another thing I bring with me is a light table, which is something fun and different that you don't get a chance to play with very often. And this is just where I put some cut fruits. Um, so they're backlit. So you can see here's a star fruit and here's a kiwi. And then um, I show how to make um, setups at home and use tips and tricks to um, show you how you can do this at home um, for during the winter. So this is a setup that I did that had a fake background, but um, here's a picture of the rose I took that um, came from this setup. And these were all done with my cell phone. Whoops, here's a close up of that picture. So um, the presentations that are available in person or on Zoom include historic, History of the Bridge of Flowers, Magic Wings, Longwood Gardens, and um, Birmingham Gardens in um, Alabama. So let me show you a little bit more about that. So um, my Bridge of Flowers, um, I go through the history of how it was built and what was going on right now. It's being rebuilt yet again. So I'll be rebuilding my program. So it's not available for people to um, visit this year, but it's out in um, Shelburne Falls out in Western Mass. And it's a very fun day. Um, I also have um, a presentation on um, magic wings and how to take um, good pictures of the butterflies and the different tropical um, plants that are available in these locations. And then um, I have Longwood Gardens, which um, I go through, and I actually just got back from a trip from there, and I'm not showing it right now, but I have pictures of the um, fountains in, in the um, winter display with the um, Christmas lights. It's a very, it's a very fun time. And then um, I also have um, a trip that I took with a friend of mine down to Birmingham Gardens, which I go through all the different things. So these are fun things to have early um, in the winter via Zoom or whatever, so you can get pictures. You can see all the plants and get ideas for what you want to do with your garden next year. Um, for all my in-person, um, all my lecture presentations, I do a game that's called Name the Flower, so you're not sitting there looking at um, my pictures all the time, which I show you, um, actually I shortened it to like six different um, flowers where I show you the plant and the flower, then you guess it, but you guess it from the um, option list at the bottom so that if you have anybody who's new, they can take a good guess and they don't have to feel embarrassed about knowing how to spell the um, botanical name of something. And it's also a fun way to get them to learn stuff. Um, for if this is done in person, then um, I you know, we use the answer key for everybody who gets everything right as a raffle ticket. And um, uh, you know, they can get uh, magnets or one of my um, one of my ornaments um, to take home with them. And um, these are items that are um, included in the price of the lecture. Um, if it's a lecture only in person, it's $250. Um, if it's via Zoom, I charge $225 because I'm not going to be giving out the um, the the gifts and then um if it's the workshop it is 300 because it i mean all the plant materials and stuff are provided by myself so um just want to show you these are a few of the, um, my fun images that make you think of spring we have a jack in the pulpit so these are just some of the fun things that you can take So welcome to spring. <laughs> so um, 
most, my most recent um, photographs are um, posted on Facebook um, under Kirsten, that's underscore 11 at msn.com. Unfortunately, when they goes in as an email, it covers over the under, there's an underlying underscore mark between the T and the 11, or it's under in my, or under Instagram under Kirsten Torkelson. So if you ever want to see what I'm, I'm researching for um, new programs and stuff like that, you might get a taste of it. Um, on Instagram or my Facebook page. Um, and the website is available um, soon and it's a KT, it will be ktimages.net. Any questions? No, but thank you very much, Kristen. And Deborah Turkett, you're next. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and talk to you about um, my presentations. My name is Deborah Trickett and I am the proud owner of the Captured Garden. And I love speaking to gardening groups. I've done this for over 15 years now. I've gone to all the flower shows. Um, on the upper left, you see me at the Philly show. Um, I've spoken at the Boston show, the Newport show, the Connecticut show, the last two years at the Northwest Flower and Garden show, which was really, really fun. Um, the lower left picture is me um, at the Country Living Fair. I was blessed to speak there a couple times and it was really fun. My most favorite show though, however, was that lower right picture when I was asked by proven winners to speak at the Grand Garden Show on Mackinac Island. And that was so much fun. You can only imagine being surrounded by hundreds of people that are plant geeks that only want to talk about plants. I mean, it was, I really thought I had died and gone into heaven. So I love speaking. As I said, I'm a master gardener. I'm a Massachusetts certified horticulturist. I've spoken to beekeeping groups. Um, I've spoken to master gardener symposiums. In fact, just, I heard Tova speak earlier and she and I spoke at the Rhode Island Master Gardener Symposium. So I love sharing my passion. And my passion actually started with container gardening. So my first presentation and still my most popular one is called jaw dropping traffic stopping get the neighbors talking containers um no boring containers here we're kind of done with that and i want to show you in this presentation how to just design outside the box if you, if you will and just kind of create some really really fun presentation no, container gardens rather but and this presentation can be done as a powerpoint but it can also be done as a demonstration, depending on, on the season. Another presentation that I love is Look Ma, No Flowers. I'm a big fan of foliage um, and I don't have a lot of free time. So this kind of was a perfect presentation for me to put together because let's face it, we all go out on our back deck and we're gonna sit down and read a book and have that glass of wine. And then you start noticing all the deadheading that needs to be done. So by creating containers that are foliage focused, you have less of that to do. So this is a really fun presentation. The, the picture on the right is actually my own patio because I practice what I preach and I don't have a lot of flowers out there because I do wanna enjoy that wine and that, that book. <sighs> Crazy for coleus, I am, I, I admit it, I am. I love, love, love coleus. In fact, I probably shouldn't even have these slides up here because I'll start waxing on and on about coleus and I'll go over my time and that big hook will come and drag me off screen. But it's such a wonderful annual. And this presentation, um, which is a PowerPoint, but could also be done as a demo if, if it's the timing is right, will show you how to design with my favorite annual. If you're not crazy about coleus, I encourage you to book this presentation because I guarantee at the end, you will be. I'm also a beekeeper. So I have another presentation called Beauty and the Bees, a different way of looking at garden design. And I noticed that as I was changing how I gardened to help my bees, my garden became more beautiful. I got more pollinators. So it was this wonderful, wonderful circle. So this is a, a wonderful PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if you're hungry, but this is not why I'm putting this slide in here. This is my newest presentation. It's called Wine and Chocolates. And in this, we talk about dark leaved um, plants, whether that's the foliage or the flower themselves. I think this could be a really um, neat presentation to do maybe during February around Valentine's Day. So this is one of my newest and you know it's gonna be really fun. I'm looking forward to that. I also do workshops. Um, I've done this over 50 people to as few as 10, but you tell me what you'd like to see me do, but I've done everything from succulent wreaths, you know, the succulent topped pumpkins, terrariums, 
winter wreaths, um, herb boxes, container gardens. I mean, I love doing workshops because it's so fun to see when you bring some of the same material, but how people interpret it differently. And, and I love it because invariably people will leave and say, I never knew I could do this. And it's like, yes, you can. I always say, if I can do this, anybody can do this. It's really not brain surgery. So I just love to bring in the material, you know, give you some ideas and then let people run with it. Um, the other thing I'm doing that I'm very excited about for the first time this year, it's called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, A Real Life Garden Tour. So I will invite you and your small-ish group to come to my house and walk around and see my gardens. And we'll look at the good, the bad, and hopefully not too much of the ugly, but I want it to be real life. I want you to see the successes and I want you to see the failures. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I have so many other presentations too. I have you know, tips, tricks, and trade secrets, which is fast moving, but lots of information. I have chameleon containers, um, which is about taking a container and transitioning it into another season. I have um, power couples putting perennials together. I have 10 most popular container plants and why you shouldn't use them. I mean, I have a lot of presentations, so please go on my website. Um, you can find a list of them there. I would also encourage you to go on my website and click on the tab that says testimonials. When you do that, you will see what other clubs are saying about my presentations. So my website is thecapturedgarden.com. I'm on Instagram. I'm also on Facebook. I know I've gone really quickly here, so maybe you might have to replay this because I was talking so fast. But again, I was waiting for the big hook to pull me off. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. Maria von Brinken. Maria, are you ready? Hi, hey, there you are. I see you, Maria. Okay. All right, hopefully you're all seeing my um, PowerPoint. Yes, um, it's up. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here, and thanks for hanging around to the very end. Uh, we all appreciate that. Um, I'm a landscape designer, but I'm also a passionate gardener, and my lectures are all designed to help um, gardeners um, make their plants look good. Because gardeners, you know, you grow them beautifully, but you often might need um, a little design help so that they're showcased and so that, um, for instance, they bloom from um, early spring till frost. This is one of my gardens. And in fact, all the slides feature some of the gardens that I've designed. So I'm a certified designer and an artist and garden by set, gardener by obsession. And, you know, I have all the qualifications and this is what you'll see in the ad. Um, so my uh, talks, again, everything is geared to helping um, people understand design. And when you're starting to design a garden, the winter garden is actually the place you start, <laughs> excuse me, for a four season garden. Because that's where not only you, you can provide interest and color, you know, during that long six months period we have every year, but it becomes the framework um, for the, the, the flowering plants that follow. And as well, if you're used um, in ways, it can create the sense of outdoor rooms and also make uh, houses look great. This is, um, oh, oops, that went a little fast. Uh, this is all about flowering trees and shrubs that are scaled for the home garden. And I do use, suggest choice plants and natives for home gardeners in this. Um, oh, this is the Bressingham garden. I didn't, um, I didn't design this one, but I recommend that you go see it at uh, Mass Fort. With every lecture, I have very in intense and extensive handouts. So you always know where I am, but if you see a combination you like, um, it's all there. So you can merely circle it. And if you wanna just, you'll see you'll have your notes for you for later. You won't have to go looking things up. One of my newer lectures, and by the way, I update all my lectures, um, um, fairly frequently, so there are new slides, but the Pollinator Meadow Garden. 
it's about designing that. And it's um, about a garden that I designed. Um, of course, choice native pollinators and grasses are featured in this. But I also talk about layout, um, which is something that a uh, few people do talk about to give you a hint about how to think about layout. And of course, everything is see in succession, bloom succession from early spring till frost. Color gardens, it's one of my more popular ones. Um, in this one, I learned how to, um, you learn all about how to use color and how to have as a basis for plant combinations and of course, a succession of bloom. So part of that is, you know, uh, distilled complicated color uh, theory um, into something you can use to create your own personal color palette, but also a guideline to creating uh, plant combinations that are stunning and that will draw you into the garden. I think that color is um, uh, in our DNA, flowers are. I think that our early ancestors thousands of years ago, hunters and gatherers noted where the flowers were because they'd know where to come back for berries and seeds. Um, the classic, um, this one, classic vertical gardening, vines that flower up and around. Um, again, choice plant lists. Um, and a bit about garden history and how to use um, vertical um, structures to enhance your garden. And this one, meant for each other, my favorite foliage combinations. It's about using foliage um, because foliage, um, uh, if you have successful use of foliage, even in flower gardens or without flowers, um, you always have something interesting to look at. And they also create um, backdrops to make things look really particularly stunning. So I hope you'll um, look me up and know that, um, um, that I am at... Um, on the web and you will see um, on the Garden Club site, my um, list of lectures and all the information. And I hope that you will call me and we can talk about how to create, how to take your beautiful plants and how to show them off in ways that will draw you into your gardens and your friends and give you a moment to pause do some of that forest bathing that someone was talking about, these little mini restorative moments when you are pulled into your garden and in deep fascination, you start to breathe deeply, relax and connect in a way that's very powerful. And you know, as gardeners, this is what we know, gardening makes you feel good. So with that, I hope you have a happy gardening season and please contact me for either Zoom in the, in the winter, January and February, or in-person presentations at other times. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Maria. And now we're on to Rebecca Warner. I'm Rebecca Warner, and I'd like to talk to your club about ecological gardening. I know that lots of club members are looking for ways to put their environmental principles into practice in their gardens. Members tell me that they're planting for pollinators and growing lots more native plants. My three talks focus on adjusting our approach so we can cooperate with natural processes and still have pretty gardens. My first talk is about nitty gritty techniques you can use to make your garden more earth friendly. I talk about easy composting and making mulch from free materials you'll find close to home. I explain how you can pot up your containers without using peat-based potting mix. That's because harvesting peat turns out to be a major contributor to climate change. Coconut fiber is a solution for beautiful containers. And I toot the horn for no-till gardening. That's a technique that leaves the carbon in the ground and lets you skip the sore back when you're planting your annuals and vegetables. 
My second talk is about making your garden hospitable to native insects by growing more native plants. We know from Doug Tallamy and others that we need those native insects at the base of the food web if we're going to support biodiversity and a thriving garden ecosystem. I talk about how you can strike the right balance of insects for your yard, and I tell some truths about choosing the right native plants. I'm sure you've noticed that not every native plant grows effortlessly in every Massachusetts location. And then I offer some uh, tweaks to your garden routine that can help you to make a home for pollinators and beneficial insects. My third talk is about how your lawn can reduce pollution and energy use, conserve water, and prevent stormwater runoff. All that by shrinking. I offer some smart, attractive alternatives for some of your lawn, and I think you'll find that it's liberating to dig up some of that grass and replace it with more of the plants you love. If you'd like to know more about my approach, please, please have a look at my book, The Sustainable Enough Garden. It's available on Amazon. Thank you, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Rebecca. And next, would um, please stop sharing. And then next would be Patterson Webster. Let's talk garden talks. Um, I'm actually going to be in Massachusetts a little bit later this year. Uh, speaking to the annual meeting of it in Andover. And so some of you will have a chance to see me in person then. Um, it's really been fun to listen to some of these other presentations. And as I, someone else said just a few minutes ago, thank you for sticking in right to the end. Um, I try to talk about things that matter to me. And I hope that these are things that matter to every gardener, not only design and not only plants, but a way of incorporating your own ideas, your own personality, and your own um, um, your own philosophy about how you live in the world into your uh, to your talks. Um, I've created, I've guard, I've spoken um, in, in many, many places around the world. Uh, I've just back last night, in fact, from a, a, a trip to Italy. Um, I am a garden designer. I'm I'm a um, a writer. I make installation art, a speaker, a photography, a photographer, and um, recently published uh, a book called Autobiography of a Garden, which is all about how we can create gardens that have meaning and significance in in the world. Each uh, talk that I give, um, try I try to incorporate things that people will will under, will get and will easily understand new ideas new approaches to garden design um, I did mention I've just back from Italy. Uh, I, I, until quite recently, I led garden tours to Italy, um, to uh, throughout North America, well, mostly in the Northeast and um, in England, uh, Scotland, Wales. Uh, so I've got a lot of of of. Um, experience looking at gardens. And one of the things therefore that I try to emphasize is how to look, what you can, uh, one of the talks I give is called Learning to Look, The Art of Garden Observation. It really does give you a chance to, um, some ideas about how to get the most out of garden visiting. I think it's something that all of us like to do um, and I think that that uh, I talk about how to use uh, photographs, garden journals, how to see, how to listen to to um, your site and to the plants and to how that using those ideas can enhance the personality. Um, Italian gardens, tradition, transformation. Uh, because I'm just back, and in fact, I was in Italy twice last year uh, with groups and 
I will be, um, in, I, each time I give a talk, I, I add something new, I incorporate new ideas, my own new experiences. But I try to show how um, Italian gardens are so incredibly significant and important and have uh, created really a foundation for, uh, for our gardens, regardless of where they are. I try to give some contemporary examples of, of um, how we can see those principles, innovative ideas from contemporary gardens um, that we can use in our own um, in our own uh, in our own uh, gardens wherever they are, however large they are. Reading the land is a talk that I I've, uh, gave uh, recently to um, a group in Pennsylvania about really how we how the garden how the land itself can influence design. What we need to do to actually understand, listen, and more than just look at, um, really to understand, understanding how we can use history, for instance, in, in our gardens, how that unexpected ways of thinking about time. And I believe that when we read the land, we get something very, very extraordinary, very special. Design ideas from British gardens. I lived in England for a number of years. I was a university there, and I have used... Um, uh, many of these design ideas uh, in my own garden. I should add, my own garden is um, what makes a garden an English garden, easy ways to define your garden. All of these talks have design and art as the principal thing. I said I'm an installation artist. Art in the garden is something that really matters to me and something that I think we, we can, uh, we can, make our gardens more interesting, more personal when we incorporate art. And it doesn't have to be extraordinary large sculptures. Um, my own garden is a, a large country property, um, some 700 acres large. And uh, we do open the garden for uh, tours. Uh, so if any of you are interested in coming to, to Quebec, which is, I should say, where I live. However, I do have a garden, who, a daughter who lives in Boston. So I come to Boston very frequently. And believe it or not, it's a short and easy drive from Montreal south to almost any place in Massachusetts. Um, Glen Villa Art Garden is my website. Um, I think my talks are fun. The response that I get most often to any presentation that I give is, inspirational. You've given me something to think about, something that I think I can use and incorporate in my own garden. Um, I've been very interested in listening to everybody's presentations, and there's so many options, so many uh, possibilities. I am indeed the program chairman for one of the Montreal Garden Clubs that I'm a member of, so I know how difficult it can be to uh, to choose a speaker. I hope that if uh, anything I have said is interesting to you, you'll come and um, get in touch or come for a visit. Thanks so much. You're welcome. <clears throat> and we'll see you in June. Yes, okay. indeed. <laughs> Please uh, stop sharing your screen. And I want to welcome Mary Hayes. We have the patience of Job to, to manage this. I really appreciate it. And thank you to GCFM for having this, which is super useful for the clubs and us speakers as well, obviously. So I am going to go through a few slides about the talks I offer. And this is a picture of my husband, Dennis, who does a lot of digging holes and packing vans and things, and our dear departed doggy, not replaced yet. The next slide. Oh, good Lord, have mercy. Okay. There's about six or seven programs I do, and one of the, my most popular is Creating Your Own Cutting Garden. So it's a... It's a PowerPoint presentation. I bring a lot of things to show, the tools, demonstrate things. Um, and at the end of talking about siting, maintenance, good flowers to grow, how to harvest, how to condition. So at the end of that talk, I do a demonstration of a spiral tie bouquet, which gets people thinking what they can do, you know, with the beautiful flowers they're going to grow. So on this slide, that's the top picture on the left, on the right is just a bucket of flowers harvested in the spring. Lower right is a, is a fall autumn arrangement. It's a great thing to do. So I really encourage people to have their own cutting garden. My second um, <clears throat> equally popular program is the embellished pumpkins, which I've done for, I think five or six years at lots of 
for many clubs, many venues, it is a hands-on workshop. Everybody gets a small mini pumpkin and we decorate it with all kinds of good stuff. Flowers that dry well, succulents, air plants, straw flowers, just beautiful things. They're, it's very fun to make. They honestly last for months. So it's, it's very fun. I have very limited availability um, for this. It's really October, end of September, October, early November. Uh, it's limited number of slots. So if it's something you want to do, please let me know soon. And other things, I, I don't really like to do talks where I just do a PowerPoint and talk. I, it's not my personality. I really enjoy the hands-on. I love to help um, people experiment with things, play with flowers. And that to me is kind of what I'm best at. So I'm kind of limiting the programs I do to this. The petite florals, whether it's an artful bud vase or making May Day posies, <clears throat> allow you to have the hands-on workshop at a fairly low cost. So that's kind of the bonus is, if you're not making a big arrangement, it's not gonna cost your members a huge amount of money. It still will cost some money, but these are more doable. So lower supply cost, you can easily do it within an hour. And the other kind of positive thing is, <clears throat> you still can cover lots of very important design concepts, even in this kind of miniature version. Do, do, do. And another one I've started just this year is doing an Ikebana style dish floral. And the good thing about this, again, it's a low supply cost. You have a limited number of stems, but you get to really kind of cover some key concepts in floral design. That's my own timer saying I have a minute left. It's not Ikebana because I'm not a certified Ikebana instructor. It is, however, in the style of Ikebana. So I think it's it's okay to do that. They're very fun and it doesn't take people much time to make them, but to be thoughtful about your flowers and your arranging them is, is kind of a good exercise. I have a program on green alternatives to floral foam. We cover pin frogs, chicken wire, the choir pouch. There's a new product called foam, P-H-O-A-M, made out of corn apparently. Not on the market yet, but will be I think by this fall. So we, we go through all those because you really don't want to use floral foam. <clears throat> you want to minimize your use. Some people never use it. I use it sometimes. And we talk about how green is it and what is the life cycle of any product, which kind of weighs into your factor. And I think we're second to last. Ah, so I, I'm doing a program on tulips because they're so crazy. They're so beautiful. If you grow your own, you get the most beautiful or go to Five Forks Farms. Uh, harvesting, you can store them on the bulb for weeks. There's just ways to kind of make them easier to work with. So I think that would be a terrific kind of April program. And last but not least, <clears throat> I do floral head crowns. Not a huge amount of interest, but there's some. And the advantage is it's the same technique as making a wreath or even a garland, but it's a much smaller amount of product. It's more doable in an hour. So it's sort of a fun thing to do. I have done wreath programs. They're just become too costly. It sort of takes too long to do a nice wreath within an hour's time has been my experience. So that's all. My last thing I wanted to say, I'm happy to make up programs if your club has an idea. So yesterday for a club in Marshfield, we made these adorable things. This is, they had vintage teacups and we made little arrangements in the teacups and people loved it. It was really fun and they made beautiful things. So that's um, my deal. Contact me if you're interested, want to talk about what programs might work for your club. And I thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Mary. You welcome Carol Cohen. Carol, go ahead. Hi, I'm sorry if I'm facing a different way to talk, but my speaker, I don't know what happened to my microphone. So hi, everybody. I'm Carol Cohen. I'm thank you for um, allowing me to come. And my program is a little bit different. I am not a great gardener, but I am a great Eleanor Roosevelt. I've been portraying her for about eight years to many um, types of organizations. So I'll just go through my PowerPoint. Um, if you can, you can read my PowerPoint. I'm going to go backwards. Sorry, uh, back. 
So I actually um, have two or three, I have three Eleanor Roosevelt programs, but the one most relevant to you, or if you're in a different organization, maybe all three would be, but um, this particular one called A Walk Through the Garden with Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, we're in her house backyard at Val Kill. It's 1949, and she's doing a recognition ceremony for those who helped um, feed America during World War II. And I'm going to show you a few uh, quotes because I think people like to know um, where I've been and who has enjoyed my program rather than every little thing that I do. So in any event, uh, here I am in October 23rd at the Bridgewater Garden Club where they invited the presidents of 17 garden clubs from uh, the Cranberry region. Uh, we had a great time with Eleanor Roosevelt and um, here's one of the quotes from a member. Here I am at the Middleborough Public Library in August where we tried doing part of it outside and then inside, so my programs are um, half, uh, half portrayal and half PowerPoint. Um, and just a little bit of my PowerPoint. So I portray Eleanor for half an hour. I, I'm interactive with people in the audience. I make believe people are my neighbors, friends, news hounds, relatives coming to visit to hear about um, being re recognized. So um, my, my PowerPoint is Victory Gardens, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. And of course, most people know or maybe not know that Eleanor Roosevelt planted a victory garden on the White House lawn with a young girl, Diana, um, whose father, Hopkins, who's di whose father worked at the White House. And um, during World War II, some 20 million victory gardens were planted and it's all because of Eleanor Roosevelt. But um, one of the people who are being honored at my quote, recognition ceremony is Richard Parker, who um, single-handedly almost um, saved the um, Fenway Victory Garden from being dismantled after World War II. It's the oldest Victory Garden in America. And here it is. You can see an overview and a map and some of uh, it's in the shadow of Fenway Park. Uh, the uh, garden went from 69 spaces during World War II to over 500 now. It's a great field trip. This is my friend Elizabeth Bertazzoli, who was president of the Fenway Gardens. And here is her one of her two gardens. This one is a pollinator garden. And I talk about um, the Fenway Victory Gardens um, at length and the other existing uh, Fen uh, Victory Garden in Minneapolis. Um, it's an extensive PowerPoint, starting with World War I and going up to uh, the present day and beyond. Um, Michelle Obama had a victory garden in 2009. I talk all about her and her book and her in initiatives. And that in 2025, the Obama Presidential Center has chosen to have an Eleanor Roosevelt fruit and vegetable garden. And that is gonna be a new part of my PowerPoint. Um, and of course, during COVID people brought back Victory Gardens. There's lots and lots of articles about it and wonderful, wonderful videos and examples of gardening during the pandemic. And of course, the future of Victory Gardens. This is someone who is extremely active in Victory Gardens of Tomorrow um, with his gardens and his wonderful artwork and garden supplies. I talk about him and, you know, just examples of wonderful gardening um, for sustainability today and going into the future. So um, these are my three programs and I'm being a little fast because I wanna make sure everybody who has been patient with listening for a long time is also listening to me. So this is my business card. You can see I do um, three programs. One is called a Home with Eleanor at Home with Eleanor Roosevelt, and that's more um, about her time at the United Nations um, and the Declaration of Human Rights and lessons from her. And the Walk Through the Garden is very popular with all different kinds of organizations, not just garden clubs. And I have a new program um, in honor of the 
250th of the Boston Tea Party and the coming up of the Declaration of Independence 250th, Meet Abigail Adams and the Daughters of Liberty. And if you know Abigail, she had a fantastic garden um, at Peacefield where roses she brought from England. So uh, that will be part of the presentation. I am really happy to talk to anyone about booking a program. It's mainly in person because the interactive piece is very important. I bring a lot of visuals with me and I bring myself, which is most important. And there's my website and I can be reached all different ways. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope to come as Eleanor to your organization. Thank you, Carol. That concludes our program for today. Um, this I want to thank Betsy Howard, who will be the uh, video editor of this program. Thank you for your participation. We appreciate that. And we hope that you garner a lot of uh, bookings from this presentation. And until next year, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you so much.